Hey guys and gals and welcome back to the channel. So today I thought it'd be nice to talk about, I think one of the watches is just really indicative to me of how life works out. To frame this, there are a lot of you that only care about the watch. So let me give you what you asked for first. Let's talk about the watch. The watch in question today is this Rolex President. The first part of this video is gonna be about the watch itself. Shortcut, it's freaking awesome. And I'll explain to you why. We'll kind of go through the watch and its core components. Second part of this video is the whole reason I like watches and the reason I know a lot of you do as well. There's an emotional thing with a watch. They are very much indicative of the experiences we've been through in life, the people we know in life, uh, circumstances that played out, heartaches, losses, wins, successes. Also just hopefully a passion for mechanical things. I don't think a lot of people that buy these, especially as a lifestyle thing, really understand the incredible amount of precision and engineering that they're wearing on their wrist. I remember someone was actually complaining that she hated her Rolex. I heard this through the grapevine because it wouldn't stay wound and she had to shake it every once in a while to keep it running. And it just like defeats the purpose. So anyway, we'll talk about that in the second half of the video. Let me quickly get to the first part. This is an 18238. If you're a Rolex loyalist, nerd, hobbyist, etc., we call these things the double quick set. Why is it called the double quick set? If you've been with me way too long, <laughs> you remember I used to own an 1803, which is the first iteration of the Rolex President. Actually, to be clear, this is not the Rolex President, it's a Rolex Day Date. The bracelet itself is the presidential bracelet. Those early models, the day indicator, the day of the week, and the physical date, the date of the month, were independently set and they were not quick set. You had to scroll through, I think when I set mine for like 10 minutes to set that stupid thing. It's a labor of love. Once you get it set, you set it and you forget it and you hope it doesn't stop running because heaven forbid you have to change it. It is a nightmare to set. They had an iterative model called the 18038 and that came about, I wanna say about 1978, roughly thereabouts, maybe late 77. The dates aren't really clear to me. And that ran up through the mid late 80s, let's say 86, 87. That was a single quick set. And then ultimately where we are today now is we have a double quick set, which has been around since this model was introduced. These roughly for my own, you'll correct me in the comments, ran for about 1988, 87. I gather late 87, 88. And these ran all the way through until early 2000s, let's say 2000, 2001. That's actually when I remember these watches being probably their most famous in a media perspective because this was the watch that Tony Soprano wore. Uh, specifically, he had a champagne example. This one is actually relatively rare, at least based on what I know, because this is a, a mother of pearl dial. I've seen very few of these, which is the reason that I bought it. I love the champagne, but the, uh, I don't know, I like to be a little bit different and having something that was a little bit different of a dial just makes me feel special and warm inside. Anyway, these set independently, and so you can quickly change the day of the week and the day of the month. It is instantaneous, well not instantaneous, but you can set it whenever you need to and quickly adjust it. So if daylight savings time is we love to burden ourselves with in the US is a problem for you, or if you're traveling, it's not too difficult to set it anymore, and previous ones were a nightmare. This specifically also is a 36 millimeter model, the 18238. All day dates used to be 36 millimeters. Now, obviously they've had ones that are 40 and above. There's the day date two. There's also the 40 day date. I'll let you do research on those. This is specifically about the 36 mil. I like larger watches. However, for whatever reason with this watch, this to me is the right size. I know a lot of people disagree with me. A lot of people prefer the 40 millimeter. The 40 millimeter is gorgeous. I had to be more on the vintage side of things. So what I like about this particular model is it's the last one that they made to me that was really the original looking day date. Now they're much more high polished. To me, they're much more blingier. Nothing against that, they're beautiful. And if you want to give me one, I will proudly wear it. However, this to me is, has a little bit of that vintage feel, but it's not the annoying vintage feel. So it's not like a chore of 10 minutes to set the dang thing, but it will, give me the same feel of an older watch, but I can live it with it day to day and it's very comfortable. 
So 36 millimeter case size for this guy, or this gal, depending on what we want to assign it. 3155 movement. It's been modified in this case to have the day of the week indicator on it. Other than that, it's basically a 3135 movement, which is also a 3035 movement. Architecture, late 80s, up until honestly not that long ago, within the last decade, they've been selling these movements. They built everything from explorers with them to GMTs to submariners. This was the Rolex movement that was in almost every watch they made through the last several decades. These are pretty robust. So I did have my Yacht Master, the mainspring. However, it did this, I've never heard it before, but it happened to me, and apparently it does happen. Broke. And so mine stopped running, and actually the second hand rode it, rode it in reverse for a bit. That was pretty funny. Uh, very good movement, very easy to service. Obviously, Rolex will service it for you. A lot of independents can work on these. However, Rolex has been pretty talented at getting a lot of their parts supply out of the main market so that you have to go through them to order parts. A little bit of history about this model. Why is it called the President, the Presidential, etc.? What does all this mean? It's called the Rolex Day Date. It's been around since roughly the 1950s. It's very much from the mid-century of Rolex. It's from the earlier generation when they first came out with the Oyster case. This is one of their earlier models that they've had for a long time. One of the things that I think people appreciate so much about Rolex is they're very true to their heritage and they stay consistent through time. So that's why the resale is so great because they all kind of look the same, which is great. An old one and a new one are so similar that they both benefit from a really good resale value. Also, it is timeless and it's like, it's like a Porsche 911 as an example. If it's not broken, why fix it? The day date colloquially became known as the president, largely attributed to Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ. Uh, he was raised in Texas and went on to become the president. Um, he had been vice president under John F. Kennedy. When John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he assumed the presidency. Very interesting guy, uh, quite a character. There's some pretty salacious stories about him, inviting, inviting journalists into the bathroom with him, the way he used to intimidate people, kind of lean in on people to kind of get what he wanted. Super fascinating guy, kind of controversial. Uh, the whole story of the Vietnam War and everything else. I'll spare you here. Massive fan of this watch he was. Specifically, he used to get the Moyes gifts. And so this bracelet was called the presidential bracelet. This was not the only option you could get on these. The watch, just because of Johnson wearing it and others, has basically been called the Rolex president ever since, even though it's technically the day date with the presidential bracelet. Not the only president or famous person to wear one of these watches. Lots of celebrities wear these watches, obviously, but even uh, famous people that you wouldn't think of that are just big in industries. Henry Ford II was gifted one of these that he famously never wore and actually gave to the Greenfield Village Museum that was his father's museum in Dearborn, Michigan. These watches are ubiquitous with very famous people, also not necessarily some very nice people. Uh, you could do a quick uh, Google search and see that there's plenty of dictators that have worn these watches. It's not a shy watch. It is a solid 18 karat piece of gold. They are quite heavy. The newer ones that have solid links completely through are even heavier. And one of the things that's notorious with these watches and something you really gotta be careful for if you look out for one, this one that I have is, is absolute mint, but the, uh, the bracelet's will stretch. It actually might have a little bit of stretch to it. It is not uncommon to see these things buckled over their center and basically falling off of the watch. Uh, I've heard of these going through multiple bracelets in people's lifetime. Replacing a bracelet on one of these watches is an $8,000 plus affair. There's a lot of these on the secondhand market that have aftermarket bracelets that were made in Italy or other countries that apart from the, the smelt value of melting the gold down, really don't have any real value. And so if you're looking to buy one of these on the second market, buy the best one you can buy, make sure the bracelet's in good shape and it's been taken care of, make sure the dial's original. A lot of these things have aftermarket dials that have been kind of messed up or just not done to the lower Rolex standard. You will see, like for example, this is a factory mother of pearl dial. There are plenty of ones that are floating with mother of pearl dials that did not come from the Rolex factory and they're worth considerably less money because of that factor. There's also a lot of these that have been bedazzled with lots of aftermarket diamonds, usually not to the standard that Rolex would have done it, and quite honestly, that hurts the value of these watches if you find those. When you're looking at one of these watches, it's all about originality. You want a Rolex factory dial. If it's a diamond bezel, it has to be a Rolex diamond bezel, and you want the bracelet to be in good shape. 
These are all about condition with these watches. You will see, if you look online at retailers, the range of these watches on the low end when they're beating the crap is $14,000 roughly. On the high end, $30,000, $40,000 for make condition with a rare dial. And that difference is huge for a reason. And so you gotta be very careful what you're buying and what you're paying for it because you could very easily get a watch that could become a nightmare or you can get one that's only going to appreciate and value and be a great thing to own. Awesome watch. If you're not an elitist about the size of your watch, I do think 36 is the traditional size, just the way I see the world. And it's just a great historical piece. I mean, these things, when I think of Rolex, I think of the Oyster case, I think of this watch quite honestly. And this was always a grail for me. This is the second one that I've owned. And when we get into the story time, I'll kind of explain why. But when you think about this particular watch, the 18 through 38 within the Rolex catalog, this is the last one again that really looks like the vintage day dates. The newer ones, the lugs are fully polished. They're much shinier. They've increased the movements over time to have higher power reserves and have more anti-magnetism and other features. So like the current generation has a different movement in it. Rumor is they're having some amplitude quality issues with those. I don't know personally, so I'll let you do your own research on that. But ultimately the bracelets have become more robust. They don't stretch as much as they used to. Gold is a soft metal. It's kind of, you gotta, it comes with the game, right? But awesome watch. This to me is my perfect day date. I love it for the rare dial. I love it because it looks historic, but it is usable, double quick set. And to me, it's just something that I hope to plan to keep for quite a long time. So if you have any questions about it, any feedback, you've owned one, I would love to get your take out in the comments section below. Let me know what you think. Feel free to correct me. And if you're just here for the watch review, appreciate you tuning in and feel free to drop off now or whenever you feel like it. For those of you that are still with me, let me take a quick drink because I, I need a sip of this whiskey. This watch to me is very indicative of the reasons that I love watches. Watches to me are immensely personal. And it's one of the things that irritates me a little bit about current YouTube. You know, I was one of the first people to do watch channels back in the day, along with Archie Luxury and some other names you've probably heard of, Brightling Source. I remember there were very few of us doing this stuff back in the day. Now there's all these channels, and to me it's become this whole lifestyle thing, and it's a, you know, a sign of just it's about the wealth of it and the status, or it's some waxing poetic poem about it, or it's using a bunch of buzzwords like it's robust and effective and efficient and whatever. I, I feel like the, the purpose, at least what I find meaningful about watches has been lost. And specifically with this watch, again, it's the story, it's the personal connection to me. And this is specifically why this watch is so meaningful to me. If you've been with me for a long time, and I don't know why you would have, but if you have, appreciate it. I had an 1803, as I mentioned earlier in this video, 2011, 12, I think I purchased it. I don't particularly remember. I remember I paid about nine grand for it. And after I bought it, it was not disclosed to me. It had an aftermarket bracelet on it. So it was a bit of a wild ride with that watch. It's on this channel. Don't watch the video. The video is dog crap quality. However, this watch to me, I really look at how much I've grown and changed as a human being. So when I bought that watch, I bought it for all the things that I just said I dislike about kind of what's going on with the watch community now. I bought that watch as a status symbol. I bought it at a time when I was pretty entry level in my career. I could have afforded it easily. It wasn't a financial stretch to me per se, but I bought it because I wanted to have something symbolic of the status that I wanted to have in the world. And because to me, it was more portraying something than it was me actually enjoying the watch. Coincidentally, at the same time, I also had a stainless steel Rolex Daytona 16 or 116520 black dial also on this channel. First year of the 4130 movement. Never should have sold that watch. Story for another day. Anyway, I had that watch for about a year and a half or two, and then I ended up in a very serious relationship with someone who has since passed away, and I will spare you all the melodrama there. But I was so materialistic at the time I had that. I was very much about brands. I had, my closet was full of luxury goods. I was very much living the lifestyle of what I thought I was supposed to live. And without getting too many details, that relationship changed me fundamentally because we came from two different sides of the universe. I was in a very comfortable position, obviously spending money on objects like this that I don't really need. They were broke, having to ask people for money and didn't know where their next meal was coming from frequently. 
living in staying clothes that were bought secondhand at Goodwill. And I just remember the contradiction in myself when I realized how fortunate I was and how meaningless at the time, briefly, I felt about this hobby. And if you've watched the channel, you'll see that I actually sold off all my luxury watches and ended up buying Seikos for a long time. Still recommend them, think they're great watches. But I became very disenfranchised with materialism, quite honestly, and it kind of, it really threw me for a loop. I really minimized my life. That watch among the Dayton others became down payments on my first home. And I really got out of the thing. I, there was a guilt factor within me about having something like this or collecting stuff like this. I felt materialistic, it felt meaningless, and it felt like I was not coming across in the world the way I wanted to be as a good person. More than you need to know. But it's interesting how as this channel has grown, as I've grown as a human being, I've been able to come back into this, buy this watch for a second time, and buy it because I like the watch. And only because I like the watch, not because it was a portrays. And I'm at a place now where I can see the duality of enjoying nice things, but not letting them become who you are. And I have a lot of pride now that I can wear this watch without guilt, that I enjoy it, that I'm able to enjoy the hobby. But I can also say that it hasn't changed me. And I'm not any more materialistic now than I was before. And I still as much enjoy this watch as I do, you know, the watches I spend $20 for at a store. And so it's just, I look at this watch as both something that I'm very proud that I was able to work up to to afford. And I'm very grateful for the current collection that I have and the collection that I have had. But I also have a lot of self pride and worrying about the person that I've become, the journey that I've been on, and how I've hopefully matured into a point where I appreciate it for the reasons that I think are meaningful to me. And I say that to say, every watch I have now, and I know from conversing with all of you, the watches you own as well are very personal to you. They have a personal story. There's something that brings you a sense of pride. They were to celebrate an accomplishment. They're indicative of a relationship you had, of a loved one who you've lost, or a trip that you went on, or something you've done meaningful with your life. And that's what I really love about this hobby. There's the love of the mechanical side, the engineering side, but there's also what it means to you, the personal connection you have and the stories you create with them. And so as this channel progresses and as I decide to make more videos, if this plays out, this is the, the focus that I wanna have on this channel. I wanna have real conversations. I wanna be real with you always. And I wanna get your real take on beyond the surface level of fluff. Let's have a real deep conversation. Why do you like this? Why do you like these things? Why do you care? Tell me the trips you went on. Tell me the things you've done with your watches. That's the connection I hope we have. If you're still with me, thank you for going through this long, <laughs> ridiculous story. I appreciate you. Cheers to you. I may, uh, again, come back in the near future, but thank you so much for the support. Miss the community, and I'm really grateful that you all tune in to watch these channels. So I'll, I'll catch you guys on the next one. See you later.